And this portion will be recorded and will be distributed on YouTube, this portion of the speaker and the uh, question and answer after, just to let everyone know. And now I'd like to welcome Raj Ajar, who will be speaking to us, No Nonsense Tea from an Empty Cup, Rethinking Zen. Uh, Raj, whenever you're ready, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Beth. No, it's a real pleasure to re-bond with the UUs in Melbourne. Uh, my association with you goes back many, many decades. And one of the things I feel truly grateful for, speaking of joys and concerns, is the miracle of the Zoom technology that allows me to reach out to you from thousands of miles away in Bangalore, India. And I can see you and hear you and feel the aliveness and warmth of your presence. And that is such a precious gift to me. So without further ado, I'd like to plunge into the murky waters of Zen. Why do I call them murky waters? Well, first of all, Zen is opposed to any kind of structure. You know, one of the hymns about presence, uh, he spoke about being present every moment. Perhaps that is the a minimalist description of Zen and maybe we should just leave it at that. But I'm going to tease some kind of structure out of an anti-religion, even an anti-spirituality that mocks structures, mocks verbalization, mocks rationalization of any kind. The Zen master you know, slaps us into being here now in this moment living it fully without intellectualizing or verbalizing. Any kind of verbalization, any kind of system building is greeted with a kick, a Zen hammer, a rude noise, or the Zen master just walking out of the hall. So, uh, but we're gonna tease some kind of structure out of it because as rational beings, with powerful left brains, and most people in this UU community are, we need some kind of framework for understanding this phenomenon. This curious offshoot, brilliant, luminous, but curious offshoot of Buddhism known as Zen. Um, I wanna start with a little story. And this is where the title of my talk comes from. A philosophy professor, went to see the Zen master Nanin. You know, he'd taken a day's leave from work and off he went and he reaches the master's cottage and Nanin greets him gruffly. And the philosophy professor has a pocket full of questions, you know, questions neatly typed up. Uh, what is the Buddha? What is enlightenment? How do I reach Nirvana, et cetera, et cetera. And the master said, wait, Calm down. Let me fix you a cup of tea. And he goes in, brings a kettle, places a, uh, a cup on his visitor's lap and starts pouring. And he pours and he pours and he pours and the water overflows and scalds the visitor's crotch. And the professor leaps up in pain and says, you Zen masters are all crazy. You know, what are you trying to do to me? And Nanin replied very calmly, your mind is like this overflowing cup. Next time you come to see me, bring me an empty cup. And this it, in many ways is the heart of Zen. To preserve that empty cup, that beginner's mind, that open mind, the mind of a child, the mind of someone who's uncluttered with dogmas, uncluttered with rationalizations, uncluttered with thoughts of past and future, not beset with all kinds of fears, but rather someone who lives in the moment joyfully, but with a total beginner's mind. To have the humility to say, I don't know what the next moment is going to bring. I don't know what this moment is going to bring. It could bring me terror. It could bring me joy. It could bring in new variants of COVID. It could bring in the complete disappearance of COVID-19 from our planet. Now, I'm not going to prejudge based on all that rumor mongering on WhatsApp. I'm not going to prejudge 
based on my mimetic conditioning, all the stuff that I've learned from parents, from, from school, from uh, the memes on the internet, I'm not going to, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop miming. I'm going to stop this mimetic understanding and simply live uncluttered with a beginner's mind. And I'm not going to make any a priori, I'm, I'm not going to reach any a priori judgments or conclusions. I'm just going to let existence carry me where it will. So that's the first thing to understand about Zen. Uh, and of course, we also need to realize that part of what living in the moment means is to let go of our clinging to the past. If you remember, a few months ago, I shared some thoughts with you uh, virtually about the magic of remembering. And I'm not denying anything that I said in that, in that talk, in that discussion. Yes, the magic of remembering can help us tremendously, especially in the COVID crisis. And as we are pulling out of the COVID crisis, the magic of remembering enchanted moments, loving moments, uh, moments of joy in the past. All that the Zen master asks us is, don't get hung up on the past. Let the past go. Allow it to be, allow it to give you a few moments of joy, but then let go of it. Don't be addicted to it, don't wallow in it. There's a wonderful Zen story about the young monk, the old monk, and the young woman. Two monks, one young, one older, were about to cross a river one day to get back to the monastery after a day's shopping. And they notice a young woman sobbing piteously on the banks of the river. And the uh, young monk goes up to her and says, what's the matter? Uh, and she says, well, sir, I've missed, we, I've missed the last ferry. And my husband is going to be really mad at me. He's you know, he goes, flies off into rages at the slightest provocation, and he's going to be very upset if I return home late. And the young monk, being a kindly sort of fellow, says, okay, no problem, I'll give you a piggyback ride across the river. And so the two monks set out with the young woman, you know, clinging to the, the monk's back, and they cross the river. And the young woman gets off and thanks the, thanks the young monk prettily and trots off into the distance. And the old monk is full of jealous fantasies. You know, he, the, he has seen the moisture glistening on the young woman's thighs. He's got all these porn movies running through his head and he is furious with his younger colleague. And as they reach the gates of the monastery, he says, I'm going to report you to the abbot. You know, what you did was a violation of the rules of our Buddhist order you actually touched a woman. The young monk looked at his older colleague with infinite compassion in his weary eyes and said, brother, I left her on the banks of the river. Are you still carrying her on your back? That's beautiful. Are you still carrying her on your back? Now you might want to reflect how many things and people are you carrying on your back? Memories of the time you felt let down in school, memories of that first heartbreak, memories of that ex who was really mean and nasty to you. How many memories are you carrying? How many people are you carrying on your back? You may want to reflect on that and realize that you can let all that go. You can be in this moment joyous, carefree, without the oppressive burden of all those memories coming at you and stalking you. So that's the second lesson we learned in terms of our constructed Zen structure. The first being uh, beginner's mind and the second being let go of past baggage. Yes, the magic of remembering, but no clinging to the past. Um, The other is our tendency to create problems. 
you know, we, we chew the cud about things that have happened to us. We worry things that's happened at work, happened in our home life, something our grandkids said, something our parents said, uh, and we fret, we worry, we reflect. You know, we, we tear apart the issue till it is, you know, just rag and bone. And we don't have to do that. We don't have to create problems or magnify problems that already exist. Uh, and that's a very... ...statement in Zen. And it reflects it too. Uh, this is the story of the monk, the tiger, and the wild strawberries. And this is about a monk who is running as fast as he can from a really ferocious man-eating tiger. And he's running as fast as his legs can take him. And he's running and he's running and he's running. And there's the tiger stalking him and pursuing him. And the, the monk notices a stunted tree growing on Cliff's edge. Gratefully, he seizes the trunk and hoists himself up to the tallest branch of the tree and looks down. The tiger is waiting for him growling. And to his dismay, he says that on the other side of the tree are two large mice gnawing away at the tree. Now, the branch on which he is sitting is not very stable. It sways in the breeze. And if he misses his footing, or if the branch breaks, there is an abyss of several thousand feet awaiting the monk, waiting to welcome the monk. So, so there we are. It's an impossible situation. And after the monk had taken a few deep breaths, guess what he did? He reaches down, he notices that there's a, a cluster of wild strawberries growing from Cliff's edge. He plucks one of them, puts it in his mouth, and goes, ah, an ah of satisfaction. And the story ends there, meaning to say, no matter what the wild tigers, what the mice uh, of the IRS, or the mice of other negative stimuli that seem to be gnawing away at the trunk of the tree of life, no matter what negativities abound in our lives, we always have the choice to opt for the wild strawberries that life also offers us. We don't have to be hung up on the tiger and the mice. So that's the, the third structural lesson that we can learn from Zen. The idea that we, are, uh, we don't have to make problems or worsen problems by thinking about them incessantly, we can instead grab the opportunities and we can grab the, the, the fruits, if you like, and enjoy them in the moment. We do not have to be carried away by feelings of despair and worry. You know, the, uh, for Zen, what is is what ain't ain't. To some extent, the ancient Stoics in the Hellenistic world also said that but not as clearly or as loudly as Zen does. You know, in Zen, <clears throat> this what is, is, what ain't ain't is, is fundamental. At least for the Stoics, the Stoics would say, change whatever you can change. It's very much like the serenity prayer in our own time, uh, the serenity prayer that's accepted by AA and the 12 step programs. Uh, but, Zen says there is nothing else but what is. So don't, don't waste your time saying how unpleasant this is. What am I to do? Oh, my God. The world has never seen such a crisis, whether you're talking about COVID-19 or whether you're talking about a tumble in terms of the stock market. Don't waste time. That's what is. And you've just got to take a deep breath and accept the what is. There's a wonderful uh, saying, yes, what's worth doing is worth doing badly. Uh, what is 
there's a wonderful statement uh, in, in Zen about the Zen master, Joshu, and he lies there dying and his, his favorite disciple decides to bring him a slice of cake from the bakery, his favorite cake, adorned with plums, adorned with all kinds of goodies. And he says, takes a bite of this cake and says, my, but this cake is delicious and dies. No deathbed pronouncements, no answers to questions from his disciples about, well, you're dying. Do you have any last instructions or last words of wisdom for us? My, this cake tastes delicious. That's it. That's it. Because that's all that's happening in the moment. You know, and no tortured reflections on an afterlife. No words of wisdom for posterity. All that is BS. All that exists is the here and now and the enjoyment of the here and now. So, what is, is what ain't, ain't. The uh, One thing needs to be said, the Buddhists in general, not, not only the Zen masters, the Buddhists in general see anger as one of the poisons that can cripple us and undermine us. Uh, and so there's a, there's a great story about this, there's a great parable about this in Zen about a samurai, and samurais, as you know, could be ferocious, and certainly they were very martial and militant and macho, uh, comes to a Zen master and says to the Zen master Hakim and says, master, is there really a heaven or a hell? What are the gates of heaven? What are the gates of hell? The master looked deeply into the samurai's eyes and said, you a samurai asking these questions? First of all, I don't believe you're a samurai. You look like a beggar probably come from a family of beggars. And of course, you know, when you insult a samurai deliberately like that, your life is in jeopardy. So the samurai unsheathed the sword and rushes with this roar at the Zen master as if about to kill him. The master replied very gently, that my son, those are the gates of hell. And instantly the samurai recollected himself and sheathed his sword again. And the master said, and that my son is the gates of heaven. So it's not a question of repressing anger, by all means express it, pound pillows, go into therapy, do whatever you need, write an anger letter that you could never mail. Uh, all that is fine, all that is grist for the mill. But in the end, let go of it. Let go of it. And that's the taste of heaven. Um, and also we, we, we think of, we freeze our anger. We freeze our irritability and impatience. We freeze our lustfulness into a disposition. Oh, I'm red haired. I can't help it. I'm angry all the time. Or I'm, you know, I am so and so. I just, I, I'm just that way. I can't help myself. You know, there, if, if one freezes an emotion into a disposition, this is who I am. This is the post it, the sticker on my forehead that defines the essence of who I am. It can be extremely crippling to us. Uh, the, you know, the, the Zen masters, the Zen master Bodhidharma was approached by the emperor Wu, who said, I have a nasty temper. I'm a bad tempered man. Can you help cure me of this? And Bodhidharma shook his stick and said, show me your temper. Bring out your temper and I will beat it. I will give it a good beating and send it away. Of course, the parable is absurd. 
but behind the absurdity of the parable is the truth that once we stop freezing our emotions into dispositions, into permanent qualities, and to this is how we are, and I can't change, we will lead happier lives when we stop doing that. What do you think? And uh, of course, uh, one thing that needs to be said before we stop for question and answer is there's a lot of talk about no thingness, nothingness, nirvana in Buddhism in general and also in Zen. Zen talks about Satori, uh, that moment of awakening, but it also, like the other schools of Buddhism, uh, affirms nirvana, the, in, that all is impermanent in the world of samsara, but nirvana alone 